from Car Rigs and Ingram, this is It Figures, the CRI podcast, an accounting, advisory, and industry focused podcast for business and organization leaders, entrepreneurs, and anyone who is looking to go beyond the status quo. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the It Figures podcast. My name is Scott Bailey, and I'm a partner out of the Raleigh, North Carolina office of Carriggs and Ingram. And I'm here today with uh, Steve Williams, who will introduce himself in just a moment to talk about business interruption, insurance coverages, and, and all the things that are going on in the market there. Um, Steve, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Scott. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm a partner in our Montgomery office and have been with the firm for, for a little over 20 years. And, and over that time, I primarily focused in the insurance industry, working with property, casualty, life and health carriers, you know, predominantly statutory carriers there, as well as self-insured group associations, uh, captives across the, the nation and risk retention groups. Great. And, uh, and I have the pleasure of working with you as well in our, in our captive practice, which is, uh, which is, is one of our favorite, uh, favorite segments of the insurance industry. Um, but given that, uh, right now, as we all try to weather the storm of the COVID-19 virus, one of the things that Almost all of our businesses, at least those with the capability, are, are, are asking questions about is business interruption insurance and what their coverage looks like, what makes a valid claim these days. So there, there's a lot of questions being asked about these policies. Uh, would you mind giving us a little bit of background into what is business interruption coverage, what does a typical claim look like, and what are some of the more dynamic factors affecting the the current claim activity in the current business interruption market? Sure thing. Well, you know, business interruption coverage has been around for, for years and years, and off the top, it seems, you know, fairly simple, not that complicated, but but typically, business interruption would, would cover you, for instance, say a storm like a hurricane Katrina comes through and you have to your building and your restaurant and you, you can't operate your building. You, you, know, you can't bring people into work because you're having to do some construction and things of that nature. And a business interruption policy would, would kick in and provide some coverage during that time. Uh, another instance might be uh, you know, maybe you had supply chain disruption and you're unable to operate and business interruption may kick in and, and help with some of that. But what, what we're really starting to see, though, in response to the COVID-19 and just the current state that our, our nation is in is that people are starting to file claims related to the virus. So a lot of our, our restaurants and, and you know, various industries, dentist offices, doctor's offices, uh, industries across the, the spectrum have had to pretty much shut their doors and close down and are just incapable of operating. And so it brings a lot of question as to, to what is a claim? Can we file a claim? Well, most all of the business interruption policies were kind of amended by 2009. 2003, there was uh, I believe the SARS outbreak 2009 was the H1N1 outbreak. After those two major uh, viral outbreaks, the the policies began to be modified. Wording was carefully changed to kind of exclude viral or bacterial infections and things of that nature. And, and so the policies are is, is very important to to pay attention to what's in the policy, how the policies are worded in order to begin making claims. So at a basic level, really what we're looking at are claims against these policies in the event of a stoppage of operations. Uh, but what we're really seeing is that a lot of these policies, as you say, were amended over time to exclude uh, viral or bacterial 
outbreaks or things of that nature. So it sounds like the wording on these policies can get can get very specific, even though they seem to be very straightforward on the surface. Exactly. It's very important to kind of get into the, the, the fine print, as you would say, to go through and see specifically what is included or excluded. And, and we're still seeing a lot of claims that are popping up across the nation. Uh, a lot of restaurants, casinos, things of that nature are, are filing business interruption claims. And ultimately, it's probably going to be settled in the courts as to whether these get covered or not. But but with every day passing and every development that's kind of coming out of the state that we're in now, we're seeing more and more of these claims start to pop up. And one of the common things that seems to be brought up in the, in the, the suits and, and in the arguments is that if you're a restaurant and you're operating and your premises have been contaminated with the virus, well, you, you would have to shut down the restaurant to completely clean the virus. Or maybe your restaurant and your, your, uh, the area of the city you're located has been shut down. Then your business has been interrupted by a civil order or a federal order or mandate. And, and there's some things in the policies there that you, that uh, you may want to look at to see how that affects you. So lots of things are starting to come out in some of these court cases and articles as they kind of work themselves out. And you definitely beat me to my next question for you there is, um, you know, we're seeing, as you say, a lot of litigation. We're seeing a lot of, of activity um, and, and we're also seeing some posturing on both sides. We're seeing the claimants explore different, different approaches in these suits. And we're seeing, uh, the insurers sort of holding fast with the wording of their policies. Can you expand a little more on what's going on there and what, what folks might need to know? Sure. It, what, what we're seeing is more and more cases are starting to pop up and, and to claim business interruption. And and ultimately, you know, we've, we've seen people like Travelers and Lloyds and Hartford and, and big name carriers that are getting named in some of these suits. So ultimately, we're probably going to see this going and playing out through the courts. But we've had in the last two or three days, the, the uh, Property Casualty Insurance Association has kind of come out with uh, a position in the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, has also come out with a statement. And and both of these groups are kind of saying, you know, that that the insurance industry as a whole was was not really designed to cover pandemic losses, pandemic claims. Uh, So that they're they're kind of posturing to the effect that insurers are not are not liable for these claims because they are viral, bacterial, pandemic type losses in nature. You know, insurance yeah. design. Didn't mean to interrupt you there. It seems like it really strikes at the heart of one of the core principles of insurance, which is that where we have risk distribution, but if the risk is so distributed that risk distribution becomes irrelevant. Um, I, I could see how that would would be a problem. What are your thoughts there? You just nailed it. That's the exact argument that that the NAIC and the APCIA are are making is that insurance is designed for you know spreading risk over a large population, and you expect to incur losses and claims, but you expect to incur those in a subgroup of the entire group. Not over the entire group. It's not designed to cover losses over the entire population. And so that's exactly how they're kind of bolstering their, their argument and the position that, that these two national groups are coming from. And it's the, the same argument that, that I believe we'll see the Travelers, the Hartfords, the Lloyds, the large insurance carriers and, and other carriers across the nation will make that same argument. So that's really the 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 banner that they're going to rally under. Um, one of the things that it also seems like we're seeing on the side of the uh, of the claimants is that they're finding ways to try to get these these claims covered by claiming that they've got 
property damages as a result of this virus in that um, if uh, using the example of a restaurant again, there is contamination in a restaurant. And so they either have to remove or destroy property or they have to perform so much work to ensure their property is properly sanitized, that everything is clean. Um, so they're, they're trying to tie these claims to, to the physical property in those ways. Is this something that you've, you, you've been able to read a little bit about and study up on? Yeah, we're actually seeing that, that exact argument. And, and I've seen it in several articles related to cases that are popping up to where the, the argument that, that is being made is that the, the restaurant or the operation has incurred physical property damage because the 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 virus the nature of it is so that you know you may have uh, the virus may be alive on a tabletop or a countertop or on the you know the kitchen utensils that are, that are laid out and spread from person to person and so what they're saying is. You know, the time that it takes to come in and clean and remove equipment and to get, you know, the health department to approve for them to open back up is, is that's a legitimate business interruption claim because they have physical damage and, you know, they, they have a, an order or mandate that they're not allowed to open up until they pass inspection. Uh, you know, you might see something similar with, say, a, uh, a dentist office that was open uh, during this time, and you know, maybe they're only taking emergency uh, procedures such as a broken tooth, or you know, maybe somebody's crown is out, they've got to get a filling. But maybe one of the employees in that dentist office tests positive for for the virus, and the health department shuts the dentist office down for a 30 day period until everything can be cleaned, inspected, and determined that the the premises are not a risk to spread the virus any further. Exactly. Exactly. So it's going to be really interesting for us to see how this all plays out. It's going to be going to be fascinating for sure. And adding a little bit of complication to what we're seeing, a lot of state governments and some local governments as well are entering the fray by uh, introducing legislation that would essentially force insurers to cover some of these claims under business interruption policies. I think we've seen that in uh, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Ohio for sure. We've seen some legislation introduced in in, in California. So there's some there's some government involvement coming into play now as well. Could you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, there seems to be more and more coming out every day where, where the state governments are, are trying to get legislation that would force insurers to retroactively cover claims or losses related to the COVID-19 virus. Additionally, with that, we, we've kind of seen two proposals come up within the federal government. Uh, one was actually came out of California from a representative there that was to put together a, a pandemic a reinsurance program or a pandemic insurance programs, very similar to the, the TRIA program, which was put in place after 9-11 to provide and cover losses resulting from terrorism and, and damage to infrastructure or the, the economy in general as a result of terrorism after the 9-11 event. So the proposal that's kind of come from the representative out of California was that you would put together a, you know, a, a nationwide insurance program and that a portion of all policies and premiums would feed into that program, very similar to how TRIA works, that would go forth to cover future pandemic events and potentially to cover retrospectively the pandemic damage that has been done throughout the nation. That, that's one of the first and, and the biggest proposals that, that's kind of out there right now. And then the second that's very similar to that that I saw an article on the other day is really pushing the government to kind of amend TRIA as it stands now to allow it to not only cover damages and losses due to terrorism, but also allow it to cover losses related to pandemic viral or bacterial effects, which would, which would cover 
the losses related to the COVID-19 virus and, and help with business interruption claims and things of that nature. So it's definitely a super fund approach, which we've seen the federal government and many state and local governments do um, several times throughout, I would say, recent recent history, recent being, say, the last 50 to 60 years. So uh, it is interesting to see all this really coming together that way, especially, as you say, um, you know, the finding an approach similar to uh, to TRIA. So a um, lot of things going on at one time. If you could give us maybe one thing that you think we ought to look out for in addition to what we've already discussed, what would you say that would be the most important thing for our, our policyholders to, to keep in mind as they're considering their business interruption coverage? You know, that, that's a great question. And, you know, the first first comment that I would make or kind of caveat is that, you know, things are evolving so rapidly and day to day and there's more information coming out and there, there's more programs and there's more lawsuits. The The best advice that I think we could offer our policyholders and, and clients and things of that nature would be if, if you feel that you have a, a loss, if your business has been interrupted, you believe there's damages there, so submit a claim. I mean, get get your your documentation prepared. Uh, you know, we've actually put out two articles on the, the CRI website over the last couple of days. One is on, you know, what's involved with filing a claim, the, the type of information that needs to be gathered, the, the forms and documents and processes to kind of to help people with getting that claim in. So so my 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 advice would be, you know, if you have suffered loss, you've suffered, you've had to close down, you know there's a financial impact, even if you don't know the full extent of your losses at this moment, submit the claim. At the very worst, the claim could be denied. At the best, the may claim may get approved retroactively, uh, but ultimately it'll probably end up in the court system. But, but get the claim submitted, file early, and kind of get in the queue to, to be reviewed. Great, great. Well, Steve, I appreciate all your comments. Uh, we appreciate all your insights, and thanks for for taking time out of your day today to to chat with us on this topic. Really, really appreciate that. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely, absolutely. And for all of our listeners, thanks for for tuning in. Thanks for for being a part of the It Figures podcast. Um, if you haven't, please consider subscribing. We're putting out a lot of content right now, especially as we all try to navigate the COVID-19 crisis that we're all dealing with. Once again, my name is Scott Bailey, and thank you for your time today. If you want more CRI insights or are interested in learning about our firm, please visit our website at CRICPA.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of It Figures, the CRI podcast. You can subscribe to It Figures on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to your podcasts. If you liked what you heard today, please leave us a review. 